Our next speaker is Dr. Patricia Molina from Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center and Department of Physiology and our current president of the American Physiological Society. She will, her talk presentation is demonstrating leadership and management in practice, examples of success and errors. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I guess that that's the appropriate thing to say, right? I wasn't very thankful the past couple of weeks when I was trying to put this talk together, so <laughs> we shall see. Unlike the previous speakers, I'm not an expert in the field. And I actually had to reach out to the organizers and ask them, what exactly do you want me to talk about? What, what is it that you want me to share? And so what I got back was, we want you to share your aha moment. We want you to tell us when you realize that you possess everything needed to be a leader. That is a very challenging um, request. We would want to know the things you did to embrace and step into that leadership role. That one I thought I can manage. And they specifically said that their vision for my talk was more of a personal narrative. So perhaps what I will share with you will resonate with some of you. It may not be as generically applicable as some of the previous advice that you have received. But it did give me a lot to think about. And unlike other presentations when it's easy to go and search and come up with documents that inform your presentation, I had to do a lot of self-searching. Um, so the first thing that I noticed in the title that they had given me, which by the way, never accept the title without questioning. You know, sometimes we say yes, and then later on when we start putting the talk together, you're like, why did I accept the title? But she, they wanted me to, lead, to deal with both leadership and management. So I had to go back and look at what is the difference. So a manager is a person that organizes, that directs, and has a task at hand. A manager is somebody that maintains the status quo, makes sure that things get done, but that's about it. A leader is expected to set goals and direction, is expected to motivate a team to reach new goals, and is expected to challenge the status quo. So having a better definition of what the difference between these two, I went back to give some thought as to how I moved in my life from being a manager to a leader. So after completing my PhD at LSU, I did a postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Surgical Research, Division of Surgical Research in Surgery at Vanderbilt. I then had the opportunity to work with a very talented, very successful surgeon PI that had very little time for his lab, but had virtually unlimited resources that I could make use of. So while at the beginning it was a pretty intimidating situation where I was afraid of making mistakes or I was afraid of uh, misusing the resources that were made available to me, slowly I was given the autonomy to actually manage the research associates, to deal with the students that he would recruit. He, you know, he was a big name, he was a big face. He would bring the students and the postdocs in the lab, but I was the one that, I was, that was dealing with them on a day-to-day -day basis. So throughout this process, I guess that eventually I came to a point when I decided to be the one in charge, and our roles changed, and I became more of the one that was producing the ideas, putting them together, um, developing the projects, and I was informing him at the end of the game as to what it was that we were doing. In terms of when did I decide to actually make leadership a focus of my career? When was that aha moment? I think that in my life it's relatively easy to pinpoint um, Hurricane Katrina. So all of you know that on August 29th, 2005, New Orleans was swamped with a horrific catastrophe. And what you can see on the right-hand side is what the sign for LSU looked like underwater. That sign remained underwater for over a week, and it took us more than six months to come back into our building. 
The first time we came back into our building, there was no electricity. We had to um, go up the stairs in darkness and try to save or rescue whatever it was that we could so that we could continue to work from home. So you can imagine that that was a very challenging period in our lives. I saw my department crumble. I saw my department um, dissolve. I saw more than 50% of our faculty leave either for a better uh, position in a place that did not suffer hurricanes, some of them choosing that moment to retire, and basically a lack of leadership within the immediate core leading to people floundering, people being clinically depressed, and what I thought was going to be the end of the department. I got my PhD in that department. So to me, it's as if it was a family business that I felt I needed to do something to save. So having made that decision, you then have to define yourself as a leader and figure out what kind of leader am I going to be and what are the things that I need to learn and I need to you know, be good at to become a leader. So that took a lot of learning, a lot of reading, a lot of introspection. And one of the first things that I perhaps accepted as a task or recognized was that a leader has to do more than just push you along. A leader has to be somebody that transforms people. A leader has to be somebody that knows where you are, but can somehow convince you of where you can be. So leaders basically transform you. Having now analyzed my aha moment, when I decided to take that challenge, and how it was that I slowly started learning or started acquiring the skills necessary, I'm going to try to give you some examples of successes, and I don't like the word error. So I took the liberty of eliminating it from my title and substituting it for challenges. Remember that this is a personal perspective, and it may not match that of those who work with me or those individuals that, um, that know me. So to understand where I've had successes, the first thing um, that I had to do is analyze what, what is considered good, successful leadership. And overall, um, good leader leadership skills improve the workplace culture. So a leader has to be visionary, so you have to be able to see what you can do with what you've been given. A leader has to be able to set goals and find ways to use the resources available and the capacity, the mental human capacity, to achieve them. A leader has to have effective communication skills, has to be able to delegate and build teams, has to be able to motivate, to guide and to encourage, but also to correct when things are not going right. A leader has to be able to anticipate change and challenges and a leader cannot not like change. Finally, leaders are human beings. So leaders also need to be able to know how to manage their time and their stress level so that it doesn't become that of the others that surround them. So I'm going to use some examples of what I consider has been, have been successes in uh, my tenure. So I believe that I have developed an optimistic and a positive vision of our department's direction. We've reallocated resources and leveraged to the maximum ability um, to attain efficiencies. We've set goals and expectations. Our goal is to pursue excellence in everything that we do. We've delegated and built teams and redistributed the workload. And we've recognized the need for work-life balance. And I think that as a woman, professional, wife, and mother, that to me is a very critical part of my job. So this is a, um, an edited slide of what I presented to our faculty when I first took over. And I told them that we needed to first see where we were. We had lost an enormous amount of resources. That our next step was going to be to grow, recruiting faculty and trainees, making our graduate program something attractive that people would seek and that our ultimate goal was to achieve excellence. And I think that some of you might think um, that I'm a little bit out of my mind by saying 
or by having told them that I believed that we needed to be one of the top 10 physiology departments in the US. The environment is making it easier and easier for me every day because physiology departments are being dissolved and, you know, and, and condensed. So maybe at the end of my tenure, we will be among the top 10 physiology departments. But regardless, I think that our trainees um, and our junior faculty are being quite successful. So one of the first things that you need to do is to establish expectations. So that was one of the, um, not so easy things to do. So sometimes you have to use a little bit of humor um, and let people know that things will be different, that the expectations have changed, and that the bar is going to be set a little bit higher. To do this, I needed to communicate the desire, the anticipation, and yes, the expectation that every single member of our department was going to be an active contributor to our mission. And for those of you who are thrown into this position, one of the first questions that you need to ask yourself is, do these people know what the expectation for the job is? And sometimes what you think might be perfectly clear is totally not clear to them. The next question, is this person capable of doing a good job? And the assumption, we've just heard how you need to sell yourself, how you need to present your skills. The assumption is that you are dealing with some of the smartest people around. You're dealing with very educated individuals. You're dealing with people that have gone through the education system, so they've been vetted along the way. So you assume that the selection or the hiring process has been effective. And then when things are not going perfectly or optimally, you have to ask yourself whether there are barriers that are interfering with either the desire or the ability of that individual to perform. And that can range from personal issues, um, a fit with a team, the skills and the resources that are available for that individual. And so those are some of the conversations that have incredible revelations. Stating clearly what your expectations are is critical. I found that there was um, a confusion as to what tenure really meant. In some individuals, tenure meant, you know, the safety net that does not require me to try to excel anymore. So telling people that showing up is not enough, that you need to be productive and accountable was not an easy task, but one that had to be done. And teaching, particularly trainees, that when they're done with their experiment, they're not done. There's a team that you need to look out for and that you need to always reach out and help others get their work done. I found a diversity of barriers anywhere from health to family I mean, family is a huge challenge, particularly for female workers, I've learned. This society has not been created for working parents. This is a society that has been created for soccer moms, unfortunately. And it's hard for uh, parents to be able to accommodate those needs. And then learn patterns of behavior. Some people have gotten so used to doing things the way that they've been doing it for years that it's very difficult to change. I can tell you that for of my full professors, tenured full, full professors, were my faculty. They were my professors when I was a student. So changing their behavior and um, doing it without antagonizing them and doing by bringing them on board has been challenging. I have found that delegating and building teams can at the beginning be quite scary because most people that end up in a leadership position, we tend to think that we're the best at doing what we're doing and that nobody's gonna be able to do it, you know, as well as we're doing it. So the first thing that I've had to learn is to trust that I'm not the only one that can do things and I'm not the only one that can do it right. I've had to learn and, you know, it's a good thing that I have another symposium going on and so all my people are there so they're not sitting in the room, but I've had to, <laughs> I've, I've had to exercise patience and understand that not, everyone, and not everybody works at the same speed or with the same approach. I've had to accept different styles, and I've had to deal with 
results not always being 100% of what I thought they were going to be. But you know, it's part of the learning process, not only for me, but also for my team members. I've worked very, very hard to motivate and encourage um, our faculty and our trainees. I've tried very hard to push people to work out of their comfort zone. We all, I think, as human beings, try to um, not be so much of a risk taker, but I think I have been successful in making it easier for people to take new risks. This has required providing feedback and positive reinforcement, which is another one of my weaknesses. I grew up in a very strict household where I was expected to perform. So getting good grades was not something that I was going to con be congratulated about. It was just the expectation. So that to me is something that giving praise when it's needed has been a learning um, curve. Finding life work balance and helping people manage their stress and manage their time has now become at the core of my interest. And I believe that having children know what their parents are doing at work is critical. So I went behind the backs of the administration and brought the kids of um, my junior faculty and postdocs so that they could see what the lab looked like and wear gloves. We do a lot of socializing in our department. We celebrate every single success. It doesn't matter how trivial it is, but we believe in celebrating the little things in life. And we do a lot of um, group activities that keep the morale um, going. So in the last few minutes, let me just move to the mistakes or the errors. And there are several websites, and these are just summaries of two websites that I found, and those will be in the, in the posted um, slides that identify what are the most common leadership mistakes. And there's some that, you know, eh, cross over, but not giving feedback, being too hands off, not defining goals, not delegating, um, maintaining the status quo were some of the ones that struck me. And so that not giving feedback or maintaining the status quo, um, to me, translates into avoiding difficult people. And you have to agree with me that it's so much easier to avoid them than to deal with them. And last year, when traveling in South Africa, I took a picture of this penguin and I thought, you know, this is exactly how I feel when I just don't want to deal with somebody, you know, that has been annoying me. But I learned at a workshop that if you ignore an employee or a staff member, Ignore them completely. Don't punish them, don't reprimand them, don't reward them. This engagement is about 45%. If you criticize the person, so you tell that person, you're not doing a good job and I'm not happy with your performance, that disengagement drops from 45 to 20%. And if you can recognize even one minor strength, that disengagement drops to less than 1%. And I have two perfect examples in my life where I just could not deal with this person. And then when I finally got the courage to say, okay, I'm going to have to deal with it, you know, straight upon, I have seen an incredible, incredible improvement in performance. Another example is the waiting and hoping. And again, this, I also took it when we were in South Africa. This is a hyena that when the bus stopped in front, turned around, looked at us, and then even when the bus was still there, went back and, you know, dozed off. So waiting and hoping that an individual that is not performing is going to one day wake up and say, you know, Patricia, I've been thinking, I haven't been really doing a good job and I'm not really fulfilling your expectations. And so now I'm here to tell you that I want you to give me a list of things that you want from me. You know, that day does not happen. It does not, <laughs> trust me, it does not happen. One of the things that I'm very aware of now, um, and I'm working on it, you know, I have not reached eh, where I want to be, is my self-awareness. So Clintoria, before we came in, asked me if I have a poker face. You know, can people tell how I'm feeling? And I said, well, you'll find out in the, in the talk. Honestly, it's very difficult. I'm a very, um, I'm an extrovert. People know when I'm happy. People know when I'm upset. And this is just to show you how horrible my face looked a day that 
Everybody had assembled in the conference room to congratulate me for being elected APS president. And I was very busy. I was in a meeting with this faculty member that's speaking behind me. And I was like, why are they knocking? They know that I'm busy. They know that I can't, you know, we're getting ready to go to EB. And so somebody took that picture the minute that I opened the door. And I tell you, I mean, it's been a mirror for me to know how horrible my expressions can be when I'm, <laughs> when I'm upset. So if you are a trainee and you want to lead, you know, how do you, what do you do to move in that direction and how can you be a leader at a trainee level? I tell my faculty, faith, courage, enthusiasm, and a lot of hard work. Having a disciplined approach, um, being a reliable individual, building your networks, showing commitment are the first qualities that I believe people look for in a leader. It's very hard, it's very challenging, but it's not impossible. It's a learned behavior. I don't think anybody, I don't think any of us learn um, when we're in kindergarten or even when we go through grad school how to become leaders. You have to believe that it can be done. You have to believe that you have the skill set and you have to believe that you can learn how to do it. And you've got to want to do it um, and succeed. Oftentimes we let opportunities go by without jumping aboard. I believe that I almost let my opportunity to become APS president go by, and I can um, blame or thank my husband. He's the one that pushed me. He said, you know, 10 years from now, you're going to look back and you're going to wonder, why did I never try that? He said, try it. If you don't get it, that's fine. You know, it'll still be okay. So grabbing the opportunity at the right time is also important. Once you decide to take that opportunity, seek guidance. And guidance can come from many different places. It can sometimes feel like a daunting task. And if you were to ask me, it's worth every drop of sweat. The joy, the satisfaction in working together to bring success cannot be replaced. I have a lot of people to thank. Um, top in my list are my students, my trainees, my faculty, but I've also had the opportunity of having some real um, training through the Jefferson Parish Medical Society. I participated in the Soul of Leadership workshop led by Deepak Chopra. That was an incredible opportunity. Um, I was sent to the AAMC Leadership Workshop, which is a boot camp to learn the basics of leadership. And Many of the opportunities that APS has provided me have actually helped me build my leadership skills. But in looking back, there's two places where I have gained most of my, I guess, wisdom, because they have been able to tell me straight to my face, these are the things you're doing wrong, these are the things that you need to work on. My family, and I get emotional and my trainees. So with that, I thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Dr. Molina, and all for the inspiring talks from our speakers today. So please come up and we'll take questions at the microphones. Mine is more of a comment for Dr. Molina. Just thank you for speaking about the issues in the workplace for our women. After my postdoc, I took a break just because needing to raise the children. And now that I'm back, I'm at Western Michigan University School of Medicine. And I feel like they still don't understand the need for women to have more, not a little bit of a justice schedule. Like we're expected to be there eight to five, Monday through Friday, whether you're teaching or not, which is really, speaks to the need for more people to talk about work-life balance for people who have children. So thank you for that. Alencia Woodard, I'm a research manager at Halyard Health, which is industry, and Dr. Green, on behalf of all hiring managers <laughs> in industry, I say thank you. Um, <laughs> That 30,000 number you show is real. Um, our company actually has a filter, a computer filter. So by the time it gets to the HR rep, it's something like 10,000. The second person, it's 5,000. By the time it gets to me, it's about 45. So, and I have no time to screen those 45. 
When I get down to the five people that I want to bring in, to your point, I have no question about your technical ability. It is all behavioral questions. And I usually have those two people that I really, really want. And where my heart is always broken is how they perform in behavioral interviews. I understand I spend a lot of my energy trying to not be an academic scientist and work with other people in the corporation. What I want to know, I like to give these people feedback. Are there any opportunities for academic scientists to learn how to interact with people along the continuum? We call it managing along the continuum, dealing with people with different Myers-Briggs scores, because you come out of a lab where everybody is, as she says, committed to working eight to five or eight to eight and really, really driving, to going into an organization where there are people that are gonna leave at two to go to that soccer game or just that their focus is different. For people in industry, I say, hey, go to um, Center for Creative Leadership, but those courses cost $3,000 a piece. I haven't been able to find those opportunities for graduate students or postdocs to take or those support systems that may help them for that next job that I can't give them. You know, what I can tell you is that at my campus, I have an N of one, because I've only been at Berkeley, is the greatest opportunities to get outside the lab and provide opportunities to showcase these kinds of skills actually from, come from graduate student and uh, postdoc initiated programs. Like the one I referenced there, postdoc <laughs> industry exploration site. These are postdocs who got together to formulate a project where we're gonna approach local biotechs and say, will you host us for an afternoon? And so they go, they get to talk to VPs of managing, they get to talk to research scientists who will tell them what is it that's transferable? What is it that matters in their industry context that's very different from the academic lab? Because as a staffer at a UC, if I go to my dean and say, we need to give them these skills, these experiences, I go, yeah, 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 yeah. get them back in the lab. So it's really incumbent upon you as graduate students, as postdocs through your organizations, whether it's graduate student government, whether it's a postdoc society, or whether it's through other kinds of organized um, initiatives to go to your PI, to go to your deans and say, look, we want to have these out. We want to go to the local schools and explain science. We want to, you know, come up with the idea, get a couple of postdocs who are willing to do it, and then create something. And then you'll find lots of people like me who works in a career center or people who work in postdoc affairs offices who can maybe give you a little money to pay for the bus, who can maybe tell you who you need to talk to on campus to get the... Uh, the, the risk assessment people to sign off on it. So we can help you, but it really needs to come from them. Hi, uh, Raj Vadigepali. I'm a faculty member in pathology at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Uh, fantastic talks. Uh, uh, I do have one uh, point that I invite comments from nearly every panel member here. Um, excellent points. Everything you said is fantastic. But this is what I heard uh, when I was a graduate student 20 years ago. And so what I invite you to think about is as we think about support structures that needed to be created uh, across institutions, if 20 years from now, if yourself uh, or others in your position, similar positions, were to sit in these kind of sessions, what would the uh, report card, progress report card should look like? What would, would we still be emphasizing? Please translate your experience in your CV, because if we did, then, it's kind of, uh, as, as a scientific society, we haven't really worked out very well. So uh, can you imagine what you would probably be saying in 2036 or 2026, if you will, on how well we did in making this thing much more uh, normal, normative, if you will? Yeah? Well, I don't I'm know if that question I'm makes gonna, sense. I'm uh, going to respectfully disagree that I don't know that a lot of uh, students do indeed hear this as much as they should. Clearly at UC Berkeley they will do, right? Um, but I, I do go around different schools. I was just down at LSU last week um, giving a talk on interviewing skills and networking um, uh, uh, because uh, uh, Dr. Molina saw that there was a need for that. And indeed the students felt that uh, they did learn more. So I, I think uh, departments need to make more of an effort in uh, bringing in different speakers um, to talk about different roles. And I've done this on numerous occasions, and almost always uh, the students, uh, the postdocs and the fellows, feel like they are learning a lot. 
So um, I think your experience was good that you heard that 20 years ago. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not sure that every student does that, which is why these symposia and why uh, people such as Dr. Schnackenberg and, uh, uh, you know, go around and talk at different schools. Two points that I'll make. Um, some of these talks, although they may sound repetitive for those of us that have been around for a little bit, um, you know, they're based on, on what we hear and what we see as needs from the society level, but it's, it's influenced by our economy. As NIH funding goes up and down, um, I mean, a couple of us, David and I, and um, others that I know that are in legal or, or other, you know, doing editing and other things, about every 10 years we get asked by, by APS because, you know, NIH funding gets so tight, people start looking to other jobs outside of academia because that's what's going to be available when they graduate. So there's some of that. The other comment I'll make is, in, it was uh, almost 10 years ago uh, with, in a discussion with my mentor who moved to Michigan State, uh, J.R. Haywood was talking to me about um, the managerial roles for scientists going into industry. And his program at the time had a lot of master's level students. And I said, well, what they need is some project management skills because they're being asked to do things that they've, you know, when, when did you have time as an undergraduate to take, you know, finance or accounting? You know, we didn't. But that's what you need at this level. So I developed a course, Introduction to Project Management for Scientists that I teach, you know, online with MSU. Um, and, and then, to my surprise, you know, expecting, you know, 10, 15 students a year, one of the other schools within the university says, that's key to us, it's, it's required for graduation. So, <laughs> you know, I suddenly had 25 students every semester, and it's like, what the heck? Um, but but that's, that's how, um, or at least one point to, to try to address some of the needs that others have, have mentioned. I want to echo, um, and I think that it's been very, very clear. Perhaps within the past five to 10 years, NIH has also paid attention to how we need to diversify the training of our um, scientific workforce. And so I would, I don't know where you train, but I can tell you that as a graduate student, I was never exposed to these kinds of seminars. I never received leadership uh, um, or what is now known as employability skills training. And so, like David, I differ in opinion with you. I mean, I think that the training, the complexity, and the integrative nature of the training that we're now providing for our grad students and our postdocs is unbelievable. I mean, we have professional skills workshops on everything from how to review a paper, to how to interview, to how to prepare a poster, and we can go on on how to teach, on how to become you know, an advocate for, um, in, in science policy. So I think we're doing a pretty good job. I think that we're talking about the issues and I think that we're providing opportunities for our trainees to be able to develop these skills. So I would give ourselves an A, maybe not an A plus, but I think our report <laughs> card should look pretty amazing. Okay. So, I, mean, I wasn't questioning a need for this session. I was actually, what I was trying to point out was that uh, 20 years from now, if we are really successful, you wouldn't need this session, yeah? So, uh, I was thinking in, in that sense. Obviously, there is a continuing education point of view, but the expectation has to be every place, every university has to be doing that, not, not a selective place. Absolutely. That we agree on. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Um, Annalyn Torres, faculty member at Ponce Hill Sciences University in Puerto Rico. Um, so, I first I wanted to uh, start with a comment for Dr. Molina. Thank you for being a voice. Um, many of us are moms and dads, and um, we do become, after 4 p.m., soccer moms as well. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong about that, right? <laughs> it's actually good. Um, so, thank you for being a voice as well. Um, and thank you um, for also disclosing that there is other people like us that talk with our face, and um, we have to train ourselves um, to, uh, that it's, and we have to, it's a learned skill to control our facial expressions. Um, but I do have a, uh, a, a question which can be a bit tricky, but I just wanted to know the general opinion um, from the panel. Um, so in a resume, when is it okay to disclose 
um, racial or uh, ethnicity background, um, you know, especially because some positions might be calling for that, um, uh, just to diversify a department or other, you know, uh, sources. And sometimes it might not be completely clear from the first or last name of the person. So when is it okay and what would be, if it is okay, what would be the best way of doing it? That's a tough one. Uh, I, I don't see that there's any, any especially uh, as a lot of companies now, and indeed universities, a lot of companies are making a real effort to try and improve the diversity uh, of their workforce. Um, that uh, I, I think it's fine to put, put that uh, in there. Um, actually, I, 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 let me add to that because uh, you're not supposed to put your age in, although you can usually work it out. Um, I, I was asked to provide my resume as an example, and, and you'll notice something weird at the end of that, which is where I actually put in my interests, which includes long-distance running. And there was a real reason for that, because I was 56 years old in 2008 looking for a new job, and I was worried about ageism. So I wanted to get across that I've actually got a little bit of energy left. <laughs> so uh, I think there are ways that you can put, um, put your attributes in there. I, I think it's fine. I think it, you can't be too obvious. But I think you are who you are, and you should put that in your resume. Does that address your question? It's a difficult question, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mahmoud El Mas, uh, uh, University of Alexandria, Egypt. So I came from Egypt just to attend the, the, the conference. And I'd like to thank uh, APS and the uh, chairs of the session and our great speakers for this excellent, uh, actually, session. Uh, uh, I, I benefited a lot from, the, you know, from your talks. Uh, but again, uh, some qualities y you have mentioned and made stress, uh, like uh, being being nice, uh, being uh, uh, encouraging, uh, uh, being uh, uh, watching and observing the, the personal uh, qualities. Uh, but sometimes, you know, as, as we just saw from Dr. Malina, when she, she you know, uh, looking through the door of her office, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the leader or the chair may be in a state that, you know, he forgets, you know, all this, you know, whatever is needed, you know, for a good, a good leader or a good chair. So, uh, things like management by walking around and, uh, and really the statement that to, to, to become a, a person li uh, rather than a chair, this is very impressive and effective statement. You know, I, I like very much really, and, and I think they are keys for, for any successful uh, chair. Uh, one uh, uh, quality I think I, I did not find, you know, uh, uh, any of the speakers stressed enough relates to the, the importance of, of being firm and strong, and taking some times, you need to take some tough decisions. So, can you please comment on this? Yes, I can, I can, I can comment on that, that, that and, and that's a very good point. Um, sometimes, especially in industry, uh, the, the, the hardest problems I've had <laughs> is not uh, performance managing out people that uh, were problems, uh, because that's part of the job. What's even harder than that is getting rid of good people because the organization has decided to contract. And the hardest job I ever had was going over to the UK and meeting one-on-one -on -one with 25 people and let them know that they, their job was going to be terminated. Um, and that is where strength is important. And you have to be strong, you have to be stand by the decision that the, the company's made. Um, uh, uh, you're told not to apologize, well, that's just the first thing you do. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, because, the, you know, that's the business. And so I, I would agree with you, and I think that's a very good point. Uh, you do need to have strength, strength of character and strength to have the integrity to do the right thing. I agree. And, and I did uh, allude to that. Part of the feedback 
many times it's negative feedback. Many times it's telling somebody, hey, this is not going to cut it. And sticking to your principles and making sure that you don't change them or you don't adapt them to some or for the other, um, it's difficult. We're human. You know, we, we're human and we have weaknesses that make us favor some people over others. And that is something that I believe as a leader, you have to be very, very vigilant. I'll just add, um, you know, many of us will have, you know, the, that key person in your department or in your company that is the rainmaker. They, you know, they bring in the revenue, they've got the key projects, everybody loves them, but they never do their training. They never do the admin stuff that's expected. And sometimes, you, you know, you have to say, look, you're not traveling until X, Y, and Z are completed. End of story. And, and you have to lay down the law because if you don't, what's next? Or others will hear about it and, well, he doesn't have to do it. Why should I have to do it? So you have to set those rules and enforce it. Good morning, Kathy Hamilton, University of Kansas. I am a changing career person. I'm retired Air Force, and this is directed to you, Captain. Um, as a second career and a new uh, novice research scientist, aspiring researcher, how do I target my previous skill set as a leader um, into my new field as a scientist in my CV cover letter and uh, hopefully in the future working as a research scientist for the Department of Defense? Um, again, it comes down to uh, a lot of what was discussed in here. Um, I think all four of our talks hit on it. I mean, you have experience that can be brought to bear just being in the military. We tend to instill leadership uh, as we promote. Um, but making sure it's in your resume, uh, if you're looking at industry or, or, or the government, um, if it's in academia, uh, again, the key points of and, and what Dr. Green was saying, you know, make sure that it, it, it's not just a phrase, but ca cause and effect is, is key. You know, uh, uh, I don't, not real familiar with Air Force evaluations, but I know in, in the Navy, uh, you know, we tell our officers time and again, it's, it's cause and effect and outcome. If you can show you did this, here was the outcome, and here's the impact on the Navy or, or you know, the, the given organization, that will get you far more than just saying, I completed X, Y, Z. Hi, John Maxey from LSU Health Sciences Center in New Orleans. Um, I think I might have maybe a little bit more straightforward question than some of the others. Uh, one of the things that graduate students get pretty good at is reading and learning and then doing some action based on what they've read and learned. Do you have any suggested reading on developing management styles, leadership styles that would, I guess, help in those of us who are looking to transition um, to industry positions after our, after our degree? Well, I have to tell you, I, I, I think uh, now with the internet, it's so much easier. And, and I, I, like Dr. Molina, I, I was totally floored with the uh, with the uh, title that I was given. And uh, I had to ask advice uh, from the organizers, uh, and then I went to the internet. Um, uh, so th there are management courses out there. But uh, I, I think a lot of it is just um, uh, is, is looking at the slides that we've shown, because I think the, the, the main um, management skills we've spoken about today, the key now is, is looking at those attributes, finding which ones you have, and start putting them into practice. And, and, and even as graduate students, you, you, you're, ma you're managing your work, uh, you're managing uh, uh, your team environment, um, uh, you may be teaching, uh, you've got to manage that. So I would just start putting them into practice. Um, it, it, practice makes perfect. Courses, it's, it's doing it that's but, important. But I would, I would follow up you know, in, in that assessment, figure out where your gaps are, yeah. and then you know where to read, yeah. where to pick up, and, and then exactly. expand your portfolio. Agreed. You know, load your toolbox. Yeah, absolutely. 
Kira Slipchenko, Ohio University. Uh, great, great uh, speakers, and thank you. That uh, I know it takes a, long, a lot of time to organize sessions like that. So thank you, everybody, for putting the time and effort. Amazing talks, amazing things to to think about, and maybe like uh, introspection. But I, a little bit of reality check, maybe. I don't want to be a stick in the mud here, but I'm gonna come back to the lab and you know talk to people, talk to my people about this. Uh, but my PI is gonna roll his eyes <laughs> and be like, no, everybody has to be in the lab 100 hours a week, and no, you're not allowed to do any extracurricular activities, and no, you're not allowed to do any of the stuff, and I actually, behind the scene, behind his back, tried to encourage the students, and actually have had, I'm um, his lab manager, uh, so I, <laughs> I have a very strong personality, so I actually have a lot of freedom in the lab, personal freedom as well, and I encourage behind his back all the students to kind of develop their personalities. These are young people, they don't know themselves, they don't know, you know, where, where, so a little bit of reality check, it is a very hard, the culture of academia is very difficult. It's very difficult for these graduate students to actually go and do something extra, which in the end is gonna impede their resume, impede their, you know, getting jobs and actually, how do I convey this to my PI and how can I try to get him to understand the value of all of these things that you guys were talking about? Yeah, well, number one, I congratulate you on your courage in taking the risk of doing it. It was hard. Secondly, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and secondly, um, and one of the things that we did not discuss today, uh, but is almost equally important in managing and leading people below you, is managing up. And you have to learn how to manage up. Uh, and sometimes it can be tricky. Uh, sometimes you have to be very careful if your manager is not somebody who doesn't like to be criticized. But I think all of us, um, and, and this is one of the things that uh, Dr. Molina talked about, which was seeking feedback, getting help, getting under, uh, understanding. And sometimes um, you can manage up by uh, putting ideas into your manager's um, uh, thoughts and then it suddenly becomes their idea and that's how it works and fine and don't take don't tell don't remind them that it was your idea just let them know that oh yeah that's uh, I've come up with a good idea so managing up is a skill that needs to be learned uh, and can be as important as managing people below <laughs> excellent thank you I guess I just have one last question if nobody else has a question um, Thank you very much again to our speakers for fantastic insight and um, encouragement to all of us. You're all established leaders in your fields. We have a lot of trainees in the audience. If you were a trainee today, but you know where you are right now in this moment, what would you do differently as a trainee to become the leader who you are today as a postdoc or a graduate student? What would you have done in addition or differently? Well, I can answer that because I talk about this in, 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 in when I give a talk about interviewing skills. I would have interviewed better. Um, I, 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 uh, uh, when you go, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Green talked about this, about making your resume fit with the job you're looking for. When you go and interview, you're interviewing for one job, and that is what you want to do. Uh, so, for example, if you're interviewing in industry for a research job, that's all you want to do. When they say, what do you want to do? Why do you want to come into industry? It's not because you want to do business development because what I'm doing. It's not because you want to be doing clinical research. If you're inter interviewing for a research job, the hiring manager wants somebody who is dedicated to doing research. That doesn't mean to say five, ten years down the road you don't move into something else. If you're going for a job in academia, that is what you want to do. And I remember going into interviews and messing up because I was thinking, down the road. And the one key thing is, is when you interview, prepare yourself for that interview. Understand, uh, and I went into interviews unprepared. Get the schedule of who you're meeting with. Look at, uh, and, and do a literature search. Have questions. And know the organization you're going to. If you go into an industry, I went to one interview uh, at, a, at, a, at a company and they talked about some drug that was making all their money and I hadn't got a clue what they were talking about. I was badly prepared. So I would say preparing for the interview and going into the interview, recognizing that you've got to convey to the employer that that's all you want to do. May not be true, but when you go in for that interview, that's the job you want. 
So I have a little bit of a different uh, take. Rather than saying, or rather than answering the question, what would I have done differently or what would I have done in addition, I'm gonna answer, what am I glad that I did? Because I think it made all the difference. I was very dedicated, very reliable, and to me, those traits gained the trust of my, of my PIs, of my mentors. And I think that gaining the trust of those that are above you or that are supporting you or guiding you is one of the basic, basic principles that then gives you the confidence to take the next step, which is to lead. And I would, in fact, discourage um, concern or worry about, oh, I'm a grad student and I want to become, you know, a PI of, you know, a multinational uh, industry or I want to become a chair because I think that that distracts you from what's at hand. As trainees, there are multiple opportunities to show leadership, um, whether it's by how you mentor an undergrad that comes into the lab, whether it's by how you interact with the technicians in the lab, whether it's how you pull your um, graduate students together. There are multiple ways in which your leadership skills show. At this stage, the most important thing to do is do the best job that you can at what you're doing, gain the respect of those that are around you because that's gonna get you further ahead than anything else. Unlike you, I have never in my life interviewed for a job. <laughs> Every single position that I've had, it's, I've been rolling from one place to the other, and the only reason, I think, and you know, it's different in industry from in academia, the only reason is that my mentor or whoever I was working with had such confidence in me that he would sell me. I mean, he would basically convince the other person. So, you know, I think it speaks a lot for focusing on what the task at hand is and not really agonizing so much about, you know, where in the future you're going to be. When I was sitting in your seat uh, as, a, as a student or a postdoc, wearing the uniform didn't even, wasn't even on my radar. I didn't even know it was an opportunity until much later. Um, so it's actually events like this um, that I've been very supportive of and making sure that, you know, alternative careers, if you want to call it that, uh, are out there and uh, available for people to understand and to see that, you know, it's not just, you know, being at a big medical school is, is uh, the only job available to you or industry. I mean, those are the two big, two big players. So n knowing what's out there is important. But to follow on what both uh, uh, the other speakers have mentioned, it's okay to you know, stretch a little and look at what the next job is that you want to seek. But you know, sitting where you are, don't plan to be the chair of the department. You know, get the faculty position before you plan to be the chair. You know, and and I, I say that in jest, but you know, some people do look way down line. And, and it's important to have goals. It's important to have things you want to strive for. But you know, work on the near term, get there, and then you readjust because I can bet you if you talk to any of us over uh, you know, a glass of wine or something later in the evening, our careers have changed even within our respective industries that we never expected. And so you have to be flexible, adaptable,